Hello friends, welcome to King's Crux and today we will have something very special and a very important topic that is ocular toxoplasmosis which is a very very important topic especially for the ophthalmology residents out there okay it's a very crucial topic a very short discussion we will discuss it with a case so that you will have a complete understanding of what it is this discussion is special for one very important reason i want to dedicate this lecture to my favorite professor out there dr ratina ma'am the chief of uvia services aravind hospital madurai as always we will see this is an important discussion because this case is for the ophthalmology residents because it is a very important exam case and for the ophthalmology practitioners because it is a highly prevalent infectious disease and for pg aspirants because toxoplasmosis is a very important high yield topic and also for general physicians because toxoplasmosis is a very often presents with systemic conditions and general physicians should know when to refer a patient to an ophthalmologist especially in immunocompromised state so let us go for this and before we jump to the topic uh, i just want to give you a you know a disclaimer some of the terms which are used in the forthcoming uh, lecture okay uh, in the discussion part lot of terms have been covered in my basic uvl tract videos uh, i advise you i strongly recommend you to watch the videos first to have a even more understanding of what uvia and uvl tract and what the diseases of uvia will present as so let's go for the case okay so we have a 35 year old male okay a 35 year old male who complained with a fall of foreign body on his left eye okay while driving on a two wheeler he he suddenly felt something fell into his eyes and he and he says that following that event he had a defective vision for 10 days the defective vision is painless insidious and was gradual in progression the patient gives a history of use of eye drops around 8 times a day and another eye drop two times a day and he also has some oral tablets bd that is twice a day for one week so this is the primary complaint left eye painless defective vision now this slide is pretty busy but i just want to highlight the importance of asking the relevant questions in any uvia discussion if for any uvia case you have to ask these important history the importance being the polyosis tinnitus vitiligo alopecia all these things, including headache these are very important to ask in a syndrome called vot koinagi harada disease or vkh syndrome painful mouth ulcers and genital ulcers are very important in the disease called bechet's disease okay enlarged lymph nodes is a very important complaint is a is a very important finding in toxoplasmosis yes in systemic toxoplasmosis trauma is very important in sympathetic ophthalmia rise in fever is very much a non specific complaint but more importantly uh, the cough and hemoptysis can happen in case of a sarcoid or in case of tb inflammatory bowel disease okay and low back pain are very very important in hla b27 associated anterior uveitis joint pain and swelling is again very important uva related history because that is relevant with psoriatic arthritis which is again a hla b27 associated hla associated anterior uveitis rashes and nodes can again present in reiter syndrome also in case of a bechet's disease as well so having known the significance of each of these history i would like to say that our patient did not have any of these history okay there was a nil relevant uvia related history the past history the patient not, there was no history of ocular surgery in the past no previous history of topical medications or oral tablets taken in the past except for the medications which has been taken for the uh, ocular complaint this is a very important combinations of history which you should ask in a uvia history there is no history of diabetes or hypertension no history of tb or sarcoid no history of syphilis or leprosy and no history of arthritis and most important slide here there is no history of contact with pets no history of contact with livestock or rats this is a very important history for toxoplasmosis and other conditions as well now as far as a rat is concerned it is very important in leptospira 
as far as the the cows are concerned again very important for toxo as well as for tb in form of bovine tuberculosis bovine tuberculosis cats as we all know as we will discuss in a moment toxoplasmosis dogs are very important in another disease called toxocara toxocara okay so there is no history of such contact with pets livestock or rats the patient gives history of uh, taking only boiled water and boiled milk he doesn't give any history of uh, you know drinking unpasteurized milk but but most importantly he gives history of eating undercooked meat Okay, the patient is a Singapore driver. Okay, he's a he's a driver working in uh, Singapore. Uh, I think uh, he's a migrant. Okay, uh, he's not leading a very happy life there. He's all alone by himself. He's very much stressed out. He's sleep deprived also. And there is no history of swimming in ponds because swimming in ponds is very much relevant, especially in case of any trematode or any uh, any uh, parasitic uveitis. Very very important. So ocular examination, right eye was fine, but left eye, the vision was only 4 by 60, which is very much reduced. His IOP was fine, there was no abnormal head posture, the face was symmetrical, the corneal reflex was orthophoric, which means when I shine the torch, the corneal reflex was seen on both the uh, central of the pupil on the cornea, which shows there is no squinting of eyes. The extraocular movements were full and free. Okay, this is the picture of the right eye anterior segment examined with slit lamp. Okay. This is the diagram showing the the lids and adnexa were normal. The cornea was clear. Okay, the iris was normal. The AC was normal depth and quiet. The lens was clear. The anterior vitreous face or A V F the anterior vitreous face was normal. No cells, nothing to be noted. So in a nutshell, the right eye was perfectly fine. But look at the left eye. The left eye, the lids and adnexa were normal, but there was circumcorneal congestion. Circumcorneal congestion, which means it's going to be the dilated blood vessels surrounding, uh, you know, the limbus or circumciliary condition was noted here. Okay. Which is very much different from a diffuse congestion. But for now, just, okay, just understand that it's just circumcorneal congestion, CCC. Okay. And the patient, the iris was fine, but just between the iris and the cornea, you have your anterior chamber. And more importantly, at the back of cornea, at the back of cornea, you can see some lesions here. You can see some lesions. You can see some deposits. These deposits are called as granulomatous keratic precipitates. Granulomatous keratic precipitates. To describe what it is, I can find, this is going to be my cornea from side. Okay. So this is the anterior part. This is the posterior part. I can see some multiple around 10 large round lesions with a well-defined and perilesional halo which was centrally distributed. So if I'm going to look in front, this is how I was able to see, centrally distributed. They were thick, greasy, mutton fat like appearance, mutton fat, greasy, keratic precipitates located on the endothelium of the cornea. This was the typical description of granulomatous keratic precipitates. Okay. The anterior chamber showed two important features. One, there was an anterior chamber AC reaction was there. The anterior chamber flare was 2 plus, anterior chamber cells were 2 plus. There was a streak hypopion, a very small hypopion was noted, which is very unusual. We'll describe it later, but there was a hypopion. The iris was normal, okay. The lens was normal, it had some lens deposits were noted, okay. The anterior vitreous face showed cells 3 plus. There were many vitreous cells were noted just behind the lens that's called anterior vitreous face and there was a flare also similar to the AC flare there was a vitreous flare of 2 plus so which shows there is vitritis okay there is an inflammation in the vitreous also that is the implication so we saw what is granulomatous keratic precipitates now this is the right eye fundus which is pretty much normal whereas you go for the left eye fundus this is just a diagrammatic picture now this this uh, green color, okay, this this green shade shows that there is a dense vitritis in this patient. So there's a dense vitritis in this patient. There's a vitreous inflammation is happening there. The disc was normal. The disc was normal, okay, and uh, you can see the vessels arising from the disc. Now these are the vessels arising from the disc. You can see some exudates, okay, 
some kind of yellowish lesions or ex- yellowish deposits surrounding the vessels also called as the exudative sheathing of vessels and this was more noted in the arterial wall rather than the veins and they give the name to this as chiralis arteritis very very important very very important uh, finding in toxoplasmosis okay you can see around 2 disc diameter supero nasally there i could find uh, you know a, a raised lesion a raised lesion with with kind of a fluffy margins okay obscuring the underlying vessels which is whitish yellow in color suggestive of an active retinochoroiditis lesion there was an active retinochoroiditis lesion and just adjacent to that lesion there was a retinochoroiditis scar a scar was noted so now you have a vitreitis you have vasculitis you have a retinitis with choroiditis also and there is a old scar to be seen okay this is the picture of our patient this was the fundus picture showing the same you can all appreciate this dense retinochoroiditis lesion this is the rc retinochoroiditis lesion and you can see this part this is the the chiralis arteritis ka this is the optic this which is fine but you can note the uh, the arterial exudative sheathing here okay and this picture even more clearly demonstrates the presence of this chiralis arteritis chiralis arteritis this area so let's summarize we have with us a 35 year old male a 35 year old male with left eye defective vision so unilateral painless in series and onset gradual defective vision with no systemic comorbidities but he stressed out he sleep deprived and he eats under cooked food okay on examination of his left eye the bcva or best clotted visual acuity was 4 by 60 only there was granulomatous keratic precipitates there was ac reaction there was dense vitreitis there was an active retinochoroiditis lesion with associated vasculitis so what is the diagnosis the diagnosis is it is a left eye acute granulomatous panuveitis with vasculitis let's go back again it is going to be an acute condition there you can see granulomatous keratic precipitate so it's a granulomatous lesion panuveitis that is involving all the structures from the iris ciliary body to the choroid even to the retina as well so it's a panuveitis picture so a g p u there was vasculitis as well so most probable diagnosis is ocular toxoplasmosis but the question arises why is this only ocular toxoplasmosis why not anything else because you have a big list of differential diagnoses to consider it can be toxocara it can be a viral retinitis it can be tb it can be a septic retinitis it can be syphilis or fungal these are the infective conditions which can uh, present as an acute granulomatous pan uveitis and these are the probable non infective conditions which can again present or mimic this above picture but let us see why this lesion is toxoplasmosis only and why not these so let's find the culprit okay is it toxo i'm saying this is toxo because the patient has an acute granulomatous pan uveitis there was a vrc vrc means vitreo retino choroiditis which means there is inflammation of the vitreous retina and choroid as well and there was an old scar there was vasculitis which is classic of toxoplasmosis you see retinitis lesion the scar think of toxo first toxocariasis is another important condition okay caused by toxocara canis which is another important parasite it can also present with acute granulomatous panuveitis brc vasculitis but you have a posterior pole granuloma we will discuss it now in few moments another important differential is the acute retinal necrosis whenever whenever you see whenever you see a patient who is having a unilateral granulomatous uveitis and there's a granulomatous cap is only in one part of cornea your viral uveitis should be in the first should be in the top of the differentials okay but why not this is arn because uh, arn will usually have a low vitreitis there will be a peripheral lesion there will be no scarring but our patient had more vitreitis right why not tb tb can again present the bilateral acute granulomatous pan uveitis tb and sarcoid can present as this way but in tb it will be more of a choroidal involvement there is more of choroiditis there is more of choroiditis 
rather than retinitis. Okay. Why is this going to be DUSN? DUSN means <coughs> diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis. You will see it in a moment. DUSN is again is caused by a worm. Okay. It can cause it can cause retinitis lesions, and there'll be worm tracks. Worm tracks are classical of DUSN. There will be neuritis also as the name implies. But in our patient, we don't have all these things. Syphilis. Why is this syphilis? The patient has an acute garment span uveitis. There was a VRC, there was vasculitis, but the patient was TPHA negative. Syphilis is a great masquerader. It is a great, great masquerader, which means it can mimic many other uveitic conditions. So syphilis should, should always be in mind in any case presentation. That's why for any patient with UVL disease, when the patient presents with uveitis, Okay, either granulomatous or non-granulomatous, we should always do a TPHA, treponema pallidum hemagglutination assay test to be done. Fungal endophthalmitis is very important differential because hypopion is there, which is not very usual for toxoplasmosis. But the patient has hypopion, that's why we consider fungal endophthalmitis. But again, our patient did not have any history of intravenous injections or there was no surgeries or such because a presence of or a history of intravenous injections is very much, very much towards a fungal endophthalmitis. Sarcoid, like TB, it's a very important disease which present with a bilateral acute granulomatous panuveitis with vasculitis. But yes, again, they will be bilateral. You can see some retinocardial granulomas can be seen in sarcoid. Beshis disease presents with vasculitis, but they are non-granulomatous. History of oral ulcers and genital ulcers are very important patients. To recap, this is Toxocara, okay, caused by the Toxocara canis. You can see this is the posterior pole granuloma. This is the posterior pole granuloma. You can see this is a disc, okay? And you can see a vitreous band is connecting between the disc and the granuloma. This is a vitreous band, okay? Acute retinal necrosis is a viral infection caused by, most commonly by varicella zoster virus, basically, okay? Can also have herpes simplex virus also can cause this picture. You can see these multiple lesions, a tongue-shaped lesions encroaching the posterior pole. Okay, is encroaching the posterior pole. This is ARN, typical picture. TB presence with the so-called tubercles, tubercles, or these nothing but choroiditis lesions can be seen in TB. So this is more of a choroid involvement. TB mostly affects choroid, whereas toxo mostly affects retina. Yes, here comes the big name, diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis. You can see the live worm here, a live worm. Sometimes you can even have a worm track also can be noted. Okay, this is caused by a worm called B-A-L-Y-S, Ballus ascaris is the name of the worm which causes this DUSN. Sarcoidosis classically presents with the iris nodules, the busaka and copies nodules can have a mutton fat keratic precipitates. Okay, it can be unilateral but it, it's most always bilateral condition you can also have the characteristic snowball uh, and the snowballs and the uh, you know the exudates can be seen here the snow banking what we call the snow banking and these small balls are called as the snowballs which is very much typical of sarcoidosis Beshis disease presents with this, uh, you know, a mobile hypopion, so-called the mobile hypopion. Okay, and this you can say typical, you know, typical oral aphthous ulcers. The aphthous ulcers can also be seen in this patient. So now we have found out why this patient is not having the others, but why this patient is having toxo. Now let's discuss what toxo is. Toxoplasmosis is the most common cause of posterior uveitis. Just imagine it is the most common cause of posterior uveitis in the world, which means the high prevalence of toxoplasmosis. It is an obligate intracellular coccidin parasite called as Toxoplasma gondi is going to be the culprit, is going to be the villain causing the toxoplasmosis. There are three forms basically. You have a sporozoite, seen in the oocyst or in the egg, okay? You have a bradyzoite, which is located in the tissue cyst in the brain, retina and the muscle. You have a tachyzoid which is a free active form. So whatever in the outside of the body is going to be this oocyst, inside the body you have two forms, bradyzoite and tachyzoite. Okay? We'll discuss our details in a moment. Before that, we'll look at the life cycle.
See, it's a very, very interesting life cycle Toxoplasma leads. Uh, the definitive host of Toxoplasma is going to be the cat. Cat is a definitive host. So cat is going to shed oocyst or egg in the feces. Okay, so there's going to be egg in the feces. Okay, so the eggs can be consumed by the human beings accidentally as they are going to handle the fecal matter of the cat. Or there's going to be, you know, food gets contaminated by the fecal matter. So egg can enter the human beings. The egg can be in the grass field, which can be grazed upon by the rat and by the livestock. When this egg gets into the livestock, it transforms into so called the tissue cyst. And when human beings consume the livestock, not the rat, some consume, okay. But uh, more commonly, we consume the livestock with the tissue cyst in the meat consumed by the man. So the man and the like, uh, cattle livestock act as the intermediate hosts. So human beings can consume the oocyst or they can consume the tissue cyst. There are two infective forms, oocyst, tissue cyst. And from the females, when they get infected, that can be transplacentally transmitted to their, uh, you know, to the fetus as congenital toxoplasmosis. So this is the life cycle of toxoplasmosis in brief. Very clear, should be. So as I said, there can be two forms of parasite. One is the tissue cyst which has the bradyzoites, next is the tachyzoites. The bradyzoites are like, uh, like a cocoon, you know, where whenever the infected uh, or the infective organisms enter into the body, our body is going to fight off them. So what happens, these, these bradyzoites are going to form a cocoon, form like a shell and they just hide it from the immune system. But when there's going to be a dip in immunity, a dip in immunity is enough to cause the bradyzoites to release break open the shell they you know like the mad prisoners they just come out break out they form the so-called tachyzoites or the active infective forms the active infective forms okay uh, tachy means tachyzoites mean, tachy means very fast brady means very slow these are very fast moving very active and you can see these organisms how okay, just appreciate the shape of them they're like a arc they're like a sickle that's why the name given as toxoplasmosis. Toxo means an arc. What is a gerontoxon? A gerontoxon is nothing but other name given for arcus senilis. Arcus senilis. So a toxon, geronto means old age, toxon means arc. So similarly, an arc means a sickle or toxoplasmosis. Okay. That's why the name toxoplasmosis is given. So the pathology being this active tachyzoids are going to cause cell death. It's going to cause focal necrosis and intense inflammatory response is going to cause. So the inflammatory response along with the focal necrosis is the cause for the pathology, this cause for the disease happening in our body. Let's talk about the congenital toxoplasmosis a bit. A very important point is, this is very important because more severe the infection happens in first trimester, which means when the woman, when the pregnant woman acquires infection during her first trimester, she delivers a baby which is more severe congenital anomalies, most often ends up in abortions. But when the woman, uh, you know, gets infected in third trimester, she has a more risk of transmission. So risk is more, severity is less in third trimester, whereas severity is more, but risk is less in first trimester. Just remember these two points, you are good to go. There's another confusing point, IgM versus IgG in baby. Understand, normally there will be IgG in the babies. But if you find IgM in the babies, it is abnormal. Let us suspect toxoplasmosis. Okay. As always, any congenital toxoplasmosis should be considered along with the torches. So what are these torches? This is toxo, R for rubella, C for cytomegalovirus, H for HIV, HE for herpes and S for syphilis syphilis so these are the important differentials to consider in congenital toxoplasmosis in congenital toxoplasmosis the most common manifestation is a bilateral retinochoroiditis involving macula so when you see a macular scar this typical wagon wheel macular scar it is a telltale sign of congenital toxoplasmosis this wagon wheel macular scar an important tetrad in congenital toxoplasmosis is so-called the Sabin's tetrad, where you have these four features. 
Number one is going to be hydrocephalus or microcephaly. Number two, mental retardation. Number three, intracranial calcifications. Intracranial calcifications can happen. And number four, the typical wagon wheel scar as a result of the retinocorridatus lesion involving macula. This is the so-called Sabin's tetrad. See, acquired toxo is most often postnatally acquired. There was a time when people thought whenever people get toxoplasmosis is because of reactivation of a congenital toxoplasmosis. No, it is not true. Often they, they found that it is not the congenital toxoplasmosis, but just postnatally acquired infection can reactivate as acquired toxoplasmosis later. And more importantly, the most common manifestation is a cervical lymphadenopathy. Okay. And toxoplasmosis acquires its importance because especially in immunocompromised state or HIV or AIDS, whenever the CD4 count goes less than 100, toxo can creep inside. So whenever I see a patient with HIV and ocular toxoplasmosis, I should always do a CNS testing or CNS evaluation to look for CNS toxoplasmosis. Okay, for instance, this is the real patient, okay, who had ocular toxoplasmosis and HIV. Just look at the lesion in ocular toxoplasmosis. Such a big, big retinitis lesion is there. A huge lesion, just not typical of a, a, you know, ocular toxoplasmosis. It's, it's very large. It's very dense. Okay, I'm going to take a neuroimaging of this patient. You know what I can see? I can see this lesion. So you have a focal encephalitis uh, or what you call as a focal brain abscess. Okay, which has a contrast enhancement is also noted in this patient, which is very characteristic of, of ocular toxoplasmosis. Very, very important. So not ocular, CNS toxoplasmosis or neurotoxoplasmosis. This is the classic picture of ocular toxoplasmosis. A scar, a satellite retinocoreditis lesion. You can see these scars here. And you can see this active lesion here. You can see this lesion. You can see a, a retinitis lesion. You can see an old scar is here, which is typical of an ocular toxoplasmosis. And this very commonly described picture, the characteristic headlight and fog appearance is, is very much classic of toxoplasmosis, but not very often seen. It's very classic, but most often we see, uh, we see this picture rather than this picture, clinically I'm saying. But it's a very important MCQ, very important topic, uh, you know, very important one-liner can be asked in any entrance exams. The headlight in fog appearance is used to denote this. The headlight is going to be this retinitis lesion. Whereas the fog is going to describe the vitritis, the dense vitritis. So it's like uh, this retinitis lesion just shining through the dense fog of vitritis. What you give, give us headlight in fog appearance. Another important named lesion is Jensen's juxta papillary retinocarditis. Just near the uh, optic nerve, you can have this juxta papillary, just near the optic nerve head, you can have this retinitis lesion, it's called Jensen's lesion. Another important name lesion, the lesion which our patient had was the Kyrlees arteriolitis. It usually affects the arteries, especially arterioles. So you have the name as arteriolitis, okay. These are nothing but periarterial plaques, periarterial plaques or exudates surrounding the vessels, surrounding the arteries. Very important, classic lesion of ocular toxoplasmosis. Some atypical feature is punctate outer retinal toxoplasmosis or PORT. These are discrete small lesions which can be found in multiple areas. This can mimic other conditions, but this is one of the important atypical manifestations of ocular toxoplasmosis. Now, we have seen how toxo can present, we have seen the case discussion also. Now let us go for a hypothesis. How our patient would have got a toxoplasmosis in his eye? Just a very interesting flashback. Okay, now uh, the patient has had a postnatally acquired toxoplasmosis when he was small. Okay, so it could have been a self-limiting disease. There was a formation of scar and that scar will harbor the intraretinal tissue cyst containing bradyzoites. Okay, and he also takes undercooked meat. We don't know how long he has been taking this. So this could also be a triggering factor for the acquirement of toxoplasmosis, which would have happened at an early stage in his life. Now, our patient, now he's having moustache. He's a big guy now. There's a history of all a foreign body. The patient has rubbed his eyes. You remember 
when rubbing the eyes he might have accidentally let the tissues to trigger out or to release the bradyzoites the bradyzoites is released now now it has become tachyzoites because his immune is a bit compromised uh, you know the patient is a diabetic also okay no it's not a diabetic just he was just diagnosed then as diabetic no previous history of diabetes but later we found that patient had a very high blood sugar we don't know why so it's a newly diagnosed diabetic maybe okay maybe that could have kind of triggered this infections or this poor lifestyle he leads in this uh, in his city might have led to that so what are the reason tachyzoites have been released the tachyzoites has induced an inflammation in the eye as retinitis as choroiditis forming as retinoclitis lesion as vitreitis and vasculitis the vitreitis has gone for an anterior spillover there why that's why he had an acute granulomatous ac reaction so this is what has happened with our patient So investigations wise, it's all about clinical. Okay, toxo is a clinical diagnosis. So you have to get some very basic investigations like complete blood count, ESR, blood sugar are required because why blood sugar? Because we want the patient to start on steroids. So we should make sure the patient is not a diabetic. Mantle test always to rule out TB. TPHA always rule out syphilis. ELISA test is a very important test which can be done to detect the IgM antibodies. This is another very important MCQs and confusing parts. IgG is used for old and chronic infections. G for grandmother. Grandmothers are old, so G for old. M R modern. Modern is recent. A for active. So M is recent or active infections. A active infections. So Ig M and A can be for both recent active infections. G for gold. G for old. Okay, easy. Now this is an important table from Harrison's. Just shows that. Chorio retinitis in immunocompetent individual can because of a TB, syphilis, and histoplasmosis. Whereas when you see a chorio retinitis in an AIDS patient, apart from toxo, you should always consider cytomegalovirus infections. Okay, CMV is very important. Syphilis is important. HSV is important. Varicella zoster virus is important, and fungal infection is very very important. And that's why we consider all of them in our differential as well. Okay, and according to the suspected, we have to go for a viral culture or PCR. So PCRs are also very important in identifying toxoplasmosis in very doubtful or very confusing cases. So what's the treatment? This picture, uh, okay, I drew this picture to summarize the the principle behind the treatment of the disease. See, toxo is going to be a parasite. Okay, the policemen of the body or the immune system are going to attack the toxoplasmosis parasites, but eventually or as a as a very sad side effect the civilians or the normal cells also die okay so this is something which happens not just inside the body even in a society as well when there is a more of parasite or more of anarchy and there is more of policemen or more of tyranny the result is going to be this death or the affection of these unfortunate civilians so the aim of the treatment <coughs> is to tackle the parasites by giving an anti toxo drugs and to tackle this policeman by giving corticosteroids so we give anti toxo drugs to eliminate the toxo plasma gondii parasites we also give corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation so this is going to be the two pillars of treatment of toxoplasmosis so let us discuss about the anti toxo drugs very very important a very important question asked is what is triple therapy triple therapy is pyrimethamine with sulfadiazin with corticosteroid p s s is triple therapy Pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, corticosteroid. You add clindamycin to the P S. Uh, see, this should be C, okay? Uh, so you add uh, pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, and corticosteroid. You get quadruple therapy. Okay, so triple therapy, quadruple therapy. Both are very, very important. So let's go for the details a bit. Pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, clindamycin. Pyrimethamine. is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor so it is going to interfere with the production of dna or replication of dna so obviously that's going to cause bone marrow suppression in the body as well so that's why we give folinic acid as a supplement we give a folinic acid as a supplement sulfadiazine is a sulfa drug so it is not given in in allergic conditions or allergic patients it is a paba analog which means it is also important to synthesis of folic acid synthesis okay so as a result pyrimethamine and sulfadiazin both are contraindicated in pregnancy both are contraindicated in pregnancy 
Clindamycin is a very important drug. It is an antibiotic, so it is going to affect the protein synthesis as well. But the unfortunate side effect is so-called pseudomembranous colitis. Pseudomembranous colitis is the adverse drug reaction of clindamycin. And to treat this, we give vancomycin. Spiramycin is the drug of choice in pregnancy in ocular toxoplasmosis. Very, very important, very important uh, question can be asked in exams. Now, pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, both are very effective classic therapy, but unfortunately they are filled with side effects because you can't use pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine in pregnancy and you can't use them because they have a high bone marrow suppression as well. But so, therefore, they are being replaced by a more lighter alternatives. Pyrimethine has been replaced by trimethoprim. Sulfadiazine has been replaced by sulfamethoxazole. So, this trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole together form cotrimoxazole. The cotrimoxazole is also called as Bactrim. That is a trade name. So, Bactrim is the drug of choice currently used in treatment of ocular toxoplasmosis. Okay, very very important is the dosage. Bactrim, there's a 80 mg of trimethoprim and 400 mg of sulfamethoxazole is being used. Okay, in Bactrim DS, just double it 160 mg of trimethoprim and 800 mg of sulfamethoxazole is being used. And this table gives in a nutshell all the drugs. So, pyrimethamine, sulfadiazin, just pause the video, you can take a screenshot of this. The, the, the dosages of pyrimethamine, sulfadiazin. This is the dosage of the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, that is the Bactrim DS, what we have. It is given BD twice a day for almost like 40 to 60 days until the lesion resolves. Clindamycin is another, another important antibiotic, 300 mg four times a day. Azithromycin is more commonly used than clindamycin these days. So we give OD, either you can give two times a day, uh, you know, as, as 250 mg to 500 mg can be used. Atovacone is an anti malarial drug, again given two to four times 750 mg. Okay, this is just the antitoxidrugs in a nutshell. So, so far uh, we have discussed about everything in toxoplasmosis in detail and in brief. In detail because um, I have discussed about all the important features of toxoplasmosis which can occur in the eye. In brief about the uvia case discussion so that you can also benefit from, the, from how to present a case in uvia as well. So, this is going to be a nutshell or the crux what I call. So, T for toxo. T, tachyzoites, T, tissue cyst. Tachyzoites infective forms, tissue cyst containing bradyzoites or the sleeping dormant forms. Transmission can occur by blood, congenitally, even by organs. Even with organ transplantation, toxo can be transmitted. Tetrad of Sabin, there are four features if you can recall. Number one, microcephaly or hydrocephalus. Number two, mental retardation. Number three, intracranial calcifications. And number four, the classic retinochoroiditis lesion. Torch. Torch means toxo retinochoroiditis, which is the classic lesion of toxoplasmosis. Torch also be like torch in the fog or headlight in the fog appearance. Just a way to remember. Torch, a very important mnemonic or, 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 or very important differential diagnosis for congenital toxoplasmosis. Okay, this is not starting T, but still arteriolitis is chirides arteriolitis. And triple therapy, which consists of, yes, pyrimethamine. Sulfa uh, sulfadiazine along with corticosteroids. That is the triple therapy. So that ends the discussion on toxoplasmosis. It's a very short, brief discussion, but very, very important. So thanks for listening. Cheers.